Alors, bonsoir et bienvenue. Don't be afraid, we will switch soon to English. <rires> Mais euh, je, me, euh, je me présente, je suis Marco Sassoli depuis euh, trois mois directeur euh, de l'Académie et c'est la première génération d'étudiants de l'Académie et avant du CUDI que je ne connais pas parce que j'étais en congé. Euh, C'était euh, sous mon prédécesseur, le professeur Robert Roth, que vous avez étudié. Euh, il regrette beaucoup qu'il n'a pas pu venir ce soir, mais il vous salue et vous félicite. Et en ce qui concerne les étudiantes et les étudiants, Évidemment, vous avez vécu plus d'une année à Genève, et donc vous comprenez tous le français. <laughs> However, for, uh, by respect for your parents and families, some of whom have come from far away, I will speak English tonight, and English is also the nearly exclusive language of teaching in our three master, masters. I want to congratulate uh, you, uh, the students, the participants in the masters, those who will graduate tonight. It's a great moment for you. It's also a great moment for us. Thank you very much to have trusted in the academy, and I hope uh, the trust was justified and that you found it interesting, you liked it, congratulations that you survived perfidious <laughs> exams, um, complicated professors, meticulous teaching assistants, um, and I hope you find it useful for your future uh, professional career, obviously. Um, Some of you, it's a continuation of a brilliant career, in particular in the executive master. For others, uh, now the career starts. But before going into some details about your future career and what you should do or not do, at least in my view, um, I think it is justified and I can speak also in your name when I thank the many people Other than you, because obviously uh, you, it's mainly the, you are married that you graduated, but many other people have merits, and I would first mention your families and friends who supported um, you in French. It's even better, qui vous ont supporté, <laughs> but it's not exactly the same word, no. It means who had to endure you, in particular, um, I imagine those in the executive master who have a spouses, partner, children, and when there was a, a sunny Sunday, which happens sometimes in Geneva, um, you had to tell them, no, no, I cannot play with you. I have to repeat the concept of military objective and the, uh, precautionary measures a uh, defender must take in view of reducing the effects on the civilian population. I uh, congratulate you that uh, you were able to, uh, I'm a grandfather with my granddaughter, it does not yet work that <laughs> I can tell her. But obviously you must have had partners who uh, dealt uh, with that. Uh, obviously, We have to thank, and I'm sure that I can thank in your name, your teachers so who brought the different branches you studied to you with all their complications, but also with the values which are behind them. The teaching assistants, which at least who, at least in my case, my students would never understand anything without teaching assistants, because the teaching assistants make all this clear for students. So a uh, special thanks in your name to the teaching assistants and obviously to the administrative team, because without the administrative team, you couldn't even have 
registered and you couldn't have survived during uh, this year. And by the way, there wouldn't be this ceremony tonight, so I uh, take the liberty to mention them personally. Uh, the, every one of you knows them, obviously. Danny Diogo, who is the coordinator, and Lucie Testu and Catherine Cervantes, who were the good spirits behind your, the solutions to your administrative problems. Also, I would like to thank uh, our parents, if I may be old-fashioned. You know the Geneva Academy is a common enterprise of the Granite Institute where we are tonight of international and development studies. I always call the Graduate Institute our father and the Faculty of Law of the University of Geneva our mother, but now I was told this is politically incorrect and so we have simply two mothers and one mother is even present, represented by the Dean of the Law Faculty, uh, Professor Benedict Foy. Um, I would also like to thank the Canton of Geneva and the City of Geneva without whose in-kind contributions uh, you would have had to pay even higher fees. Um, and uh, when we speak about fees, obviously for some of you it was essential, otherwise you couldn't have been here and we wouldn't make the master if there were not some donors who allow you, those of you who cannot afford it to have a grant. And so I would like to thank these donors, in particular the Hans Bilsdorf Foundation, uh, which offers every year 20 uh, grants for our uh, LLM and the master in transitional justice. Now, I come back to the graduates. I trust that you did not only um, learn rules, but you also understood the values behind those rules and that you continue to defend those values in your professional life, which is not so easy and this is why I speak tonight to you because in this very moment I'm convinced that every one of you will, is willing to do this. Uh, that you keep a principled approach, not driven mainly by uh, personal, career, political, institutional considerations. Many will work in humanitarian organizations and you will discover that institutional uh, considerations are very important and can be contrary to a principled approach, that your main aim remains to protect the most vulnerable uh, who are the beneficiaries of the different branches of international law you studied. And as you are willing to do this, uh, in my view, you are the real contribution to a better world. And we are proud that we could somehow contribute to this uh, contribution. From today on, you are no longer students, but you are alumni. And as alumni, you have a certain responsibility in particular in the branches of international law. We study, um, we can make a small exception for international criminal law in a few cases, in very few cases, unfortunately. But for the rest, there is no judge around. And therefore, you are the judges. You are the invisible bench which judges and advocate, uh, adjudicates what is right and what is wrong under these branches, everywhere where you will work. And I hope, except again, those of you who work for the defense or the prosecutor in an international criminal tribunal are accepted from my speech. But all the others will not only defend their client, their institution, but have to 
adjudicate the law, and I trust you will do that and defend the law. Now, the chances are good that you will do that because you already chose a field of specialization and at least some of your parents must not have been very happy about that. I have to tell you, my grandmother wanted me to become obviously a doctor, a medical doctor, not a doctor in law. When she understood that I want to become a lawyer, she was a little unhappy. But then when I specialized in international law, she had even more doubts. And when I wanted to specialize in humanitarian law, she was really desperate because she thought, well, how will he live with that? So you uh, had, some of you had certainly uh, to overcome some resistance by your grant parents, I don't say your parents, uh, to that, but by the simple fact that you chose the branches you studied here, and those who are professionals, not to make an MBA for your career, but an executive master in international law applicable to armed conflicts, you have shown that you are people who are not mainly interested in career and in making a lot of money because <laughs> such brilliant lawyers as I have seen, unfortunately this was the only, um, um, as I said in French in the beginning, this was the only generation of students since the beginning of the academy to which I was not able to teach, but I had the privilege to read several of your papers and I was impressed and I thought, well, with this brilliant legal thinking, if they had studied business law, they could have earned much more money, <laughs> but you did not. And I congratulate you and I would uh, recommend you continue this way. And now to finish uh, something which is controversial and rightly perhaps controversial, but I think it is true. I would appeal to you not to manipulate the law, not even for a good cause, not even if you think such manipulation is in the interest of the most vulnerable you are fighting for. Make then a moral argument, but don't manipulate the law because I'm at least convinced that any manipulation, even for the best cause, weakens the law and the most vulnerable need a strong law with them. Thank you very much. And now I call the co-directors of the Master of Transitional Justice to come forward and uh, to speak something specific on this map. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much, Professor Sassoli. And it's obviously difficult to uh, step into this uh, big, uh, big footprints we have been left now after this uh, extraordinary, inspiring uh, speech. But let us also from our side, um, from the Master of Transitional Justice, uh, which we have the honor, Frank and myself, uh, to, to co-direct, to warmly welcome you tonight. Uh, and it's uh, quite nice to see so many people and so many family members uh, being, uh, being here tonight to celebrate uh, the graduation of the uh, of, the, of the students of the academic year 2017-2018. Um, we would like to address, uh, since we are kind of responsible or we feel responsible for <laughs> our students, address our students uh, directly. And uh, uh, we're very delighted, first of all, that uh, all of you have passed. And I, I think uh, you did an extraordinary job. That's an achievement in itself. But also, I think a lot of you have also passed with distinctions, which we will see later on. So that's really a, a great, uh, great achievement. And you did an, an, an extraordinary job. Uh, you really came from different contexts, uh, country situations, uh, cultures. 
and you came here to re reunite um, among uh, an issue which is very dear to our heart, transitional justice, and uh, the question transitional justice asks, and that's how societies uh, should deal with a violent past. And uh, that question seemed to have captured you because you applied and you continued and you succeeded in finalizing uh, this master's program. Uh, you all navigated uh, very well through an intensive year, and Professor Sassoli mentioned already uh, the intensity uh, this master's program uh, provides for, uh, where we also tried to kind of present a little bit the complexities of, uh, of transitional justice. And we did that from a legal perspective, but also from the perspective of other disciplines. So we also believe that some interdisciplinarity is important uh, uh, to address uh, the issue of transitional justice that ch that's challenging because you have to put yourself into the shoes of a political scientist, of a historian. But I think there's a lot to gain from that, in particular for such a complex field of uh, transitional justice. The Academy, uh, the academy uh, tried to provide high, quali uh, high quality program, not uh, because you paid for it, but because we believe in the importance uh, of education in the area of transitional justice. And the master on transitional justice is one of the first masters in this, in this field. And uh, there's more need, we feel, in the area of education and transitional justice. Also, our professors and lecturers came from different backgrounds, both academic backgrounds, but also practitioner backgrounds. And that's also some of the philosophy of, of our master's program, to combine these two areas, theory uh, and practice. And this is obviously only possible through strong networks the Academy has, also with other institutions. Uh, we have strong uh, cooperations with Essex University, with Nuremberg, but also with Pretoria University. And that makes it possible also to, to uh, design such a, um, a high quality program. Next steps, Professor Sassoli already mentioned, that's the reality, uh, moving away from the books uh, to actually working, uh, working on the ground. And we, we hope that you will remain in the transitional justice uh, community. You invested your time, so we feel, in a growing field. Transitional justice is a growing field of expertise. Uh, it might often not be obvious that for an organization or an institution or a field you work that you're actually doing transitional justice because transitional justice is oft often hidden behind the terms like uh, demobilization and disarmament. There's a lot of transitional justice in there or behind institutional reform, constitutional reform. There's a lot of transitional justice behind there. And uh, so a lot of opportunities for you and it's up to you and this generation of uh, young students to grab these opportunities and, 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 and to go with them. And the uh, approaches we tried to, to give you through this academic year in order to succeed also in your job is to be very proactive, to be innovative in your thinking, but to also be humble to the complexity of uh, transitional justice and to show endurance. It's not that you will uh, be able to come up with quick fixes, quick solutions in the area of transitional justice. These are processes that take very long. Uh, they take over centuries uh, and societies grapple with the past for many years to come. But what we can promise you is uh, that it will be extremely gratifying for you to work in this field. We hope also that in your professional journey, uh, we hope that in your professional journey, you will benefit uh, from what you have learned here, from the experience you could, uh, you could gain here, and that you can put it at, at use. And this brings us to the end, or brings us to the end, but we wouldn't leave you without a message, so to <laughs> say, and uh, which we hope that will guide you uh, through your professional life. Uh, and who is best to give this message? My friend, colleague, and our <laughs> chief philosopher uh, at the Academy, <laughs> Professor Frank Haldemann. Our job is always on my shoulders, of course. <laughs> so um, Thomas said at the end uh, a point I would like to raise also, the importance of recognizing our own limitations when it comes to transitional justice. I think this is very important. You have spent the year learning a lot, reading a lot, many readings, many concepts, many ideas, many readings, too many for <laughs> some of you I know. <laughs> but uh, so I think you are in a sense well equipped, I hope. You, I very much like to think that you're well equipped. Uh, and you know, I think of an equipment like a mountaineer, gloves, uh, footwear, you know. So you're really well equipped to go out there and to pursue um, different paths in the direction of transitional justice, I think. But, and there's a but. Uh, when we learn something, the curious thing about learning is that often the more we learn, the more we become, we realize that how little we know actually. So the more we learn, <laughs> it's a difficult phrase, the more we realize how little we know. And I think 
this is actually important. It's actually something we should not be worried about, and I think it's important for transitional justice because we are here dealing with a, with a, with a situation of the extreme, if you want, where we're often dealing with situations of atrocity, dealing with situations of unspeakable um, suffering, where there's no real answer, no real satisfactory answer to those processes and to those questions. So I think that the good sense of our limitations, the good sense of our fallibility, is actually essential to deal intelligently, humanly, rather than technocratically with those issues. So I would leave you with this message uh, of our fallibility, of our limitations, whenever you are in your job. As Professor Sassoli himself said, I think this is part of a principal approach to your future lives. And I will not do myself uh, to close this, uh, uh, this uh, reflection. I will do it by mentioning someone you have heard a lot about, <laughs> one philosopher, <laughs> Isaiah, Berlin. Isaiah Berlin, the great philosopher, political thinker, who thought a lot about the importance of recognizing limitations as a matter not only of being receptive and sympathetic to each other, but as a matter of actually securing liberty. And I will read out um, a quote to you, which I hope will resonate with you as much as it does with me. <laughs> Let me read. Let us have the courage of our admitted ignorance, of our doubts and uncertainties. At least we can try to discover what others require by making it possible for ourselves to know men and women as they truly are, by listening to them carefully and sympathetically, and understanding them and their lives and their needs one by one individually. Let us try to provide them with what they ask for and leave them as free as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now I have the pleasure to call the main actors on stage, uh, the graduates, the Students' Association, the representatives of the Students' Association. Please, you have the floor. Good evening. It's very refreshing to see so many familiar faces. Mm -hmm. It's been a while, and I love the smiles on your faces and the mischief hidden therein. It's also very equally refreshing to see so many unfamiliar faces. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you very much for sharing this day with us, for coming to celebrate. Yeah, now, on the screen, of course, as we will be speaking, you will see a lot of the mischief that we got up to during the year. But we are hoping, as the students, that all that mischief will be forgiven when you actually see the product of this bundle that I can you know, see from where I'm standing, the diplomas. So my name is Owiso Owiso. I am the co okay, at least for the next couple of minutes until I get my diploma. I am the co-president of the Student Association, so-called the Geneva Academy Student Council. With me is Martina Salini, who was this, is still, of course, the social coordinator for the uh, LLM group. Uh, Francisco Poggi is here with us as well. He is still, I was about to say was, but you're still the class representative of the LLM group. Uh, for the, the MTJ class, our social coordinator, Emily Amanda Di Grazia, is not here with us today. She is doing some amazing things in the Balkans at the moment. And Juan Daniel Salazar, who was the class representative, still is. I keep forgetting that. And then my co-president, Faisal Omar, Faisal Omar, sorry, uh, from the LLM group, is not able to join us today. So basically, I will be giving a few remarks. I hope to be very brief. Then I will hand over to my colleague, Martina, who has a more elaborate speech, because she's better at this kind of thing than I am. I do not have a speech, but I just have pointers. So you know, bear with me. I cannot summarize the year we had. For slightly over 10 months, we got up to a lot of mischief, a lot of academic rigor. But eventually, we are here today, and that is the most important thing. So as I said earlier, please forgive all the mischief you will see here. But of course, I have to admit that a lot of the mischief is hidden. This is just the fairer part of it. Eventually, we are here. We are celebrating today. We are graduating. So the parents, please, bear with us and instead celebrate with us. Because we eventually made it to the end, uh, despite, or, yeah, despite or because of, mostly, uh, the rigor of our lecturers. Frank, we will never forget your slides. 
<laughs> and I, I, I was hoping to see your, your daughter, Kiara, here, because we are very convinced that she helped you make them. But unfortunately, <laughs> she, she is not here with us. Now, the, the Academy achieves so many things, so many things that it does not want to admit. But according to me, the, the takeaway from there is that the Academy manages and has managed over the years and will continue to manage to ignite the power of imagination in us. And the power of imagination, at least according to me, is the most powerful force that has ever been made available to mankind. I am not very wise. That is not wisdom from me. That is Morgan Freeman. I am just quoting him. <laughs> and so the Academy manages to do that, and that is the key giveaway, you know, the key takeaway that I get from the Academy. In, in, in summary, of course, so in addition to so many other things that uh, you, know, you can only tell from looking at the alumni and everybody else out there who is associated with the Academy. Of course, I am not a hopeless romantic. This field is not a very lucrative field, as Professor Sassoli said. As Kofi Annan pointed out uh, before his death, uh, may he rest in peace, that despots, tyrants, purveyors of injustice, these people will always be with us. That is the world we live in. That sounds very gloomy. But Kofi Annan proceeds to say, quoting a Swahili proverb, that we should always remember when we venture into this field that we have chosen by virtue of going through the academy, that theirs is not the only wind that can turn the sails. Our wind is much more powerful than their wind. And in that regard, I believe that the academy has managed to instill in us a very unique skill set, a skill set so unique that it makes the power of our wind much more powerful than, that, than those of the, purvey the purveyors of injustice that bedevil our world. And on that note, as I promised, I will be very brief. I am done. Martina Salini, the floor is yours. Thank you. Dear professors, staff members, honored guests, fellow graduates, on behalf of the graduating LLM class of 2018, allow me to welcome you all again and to thank you for celebrating this very special day with us. Nearly a year has passed since our journey at the Geneva Academy began. This journey has certainly been a complicated and challenging one for all. At times, in the middle of it, we wanted to give up. We wanted to pack our heavy books and bags and go back home. But now, wow, just looking at all those smiling faces, Yes, we made it. Today, we are gathered here to celebrate a great success, one we can definitely be proud of. But every end has a new beginning. And today, despite representing the last day for some of us as students, also represents the beginning of a new journey, probably a more complicated one. And I want to encourage you all to never give up. I want to encourage you all to always use the same spirit you have shown throughout the year. The same sacrifice you have made, the same sleepless nights and evenings in Picciotto common room you have endured, the same perseverance and motivation, and this, my fellow graduates, will be the ticket to our success. The Geneva Academy has accomplished its tax, providing us with the best quality education, with countless enriching experience, but more importantly, with a deep sense of humanity. And it is now up to us to make the most of it, to change our lives, our families, our communities, and humanity in general with the expertise and values we acquired during our LLM at the Geneva Academy. However, the big question for many of us now remains, what we're going to do next? And I didn't know that Oviso was also about to quote Kofi Annan, but ask Kofi Annan, whose recent death represents a great love for humanity, once said, to live is to choose, but to choose well, you must know who you are and what you stand for. Where do you want to go and why you want to get there? And I say to you right here today, whether you choose to take a well-deserved, by the way, gap year, to go for that PhD or for your dream job, always remember who you are and what you stand for. Never compromise the values and principles that brought you to apply to this LLM in the very first place. Before closing this chapter of our life and starting the next one, let's just take a minute to thank all the people that have been with us along this journey. To all our families, 
Thank you for your love and guidance throughout the years. Thank you for uh, your unconditional support, regardless of the difficulties of our field, and more importantly, the never-ending unpaid internships. <laughs> <laughs> to our professor, thank you for having shared with us your passion and leading expertise. You truly inspired us, and I hope we will not disappoint you in the future. To our teaching assistants, thank you for your precious help and your incredible patience. Without you, many of us would, would not be standing here today. To the Academy staff members like Danny, Lucy, and Catherine, who took care of us with love, we say merci beaucoup. And I hope you will excuse us for the thousand emails and impossible requests you received from us throughout the year. Maybe in a decade from now, we will not remember some of the international humanitarian law or international human rights. Human rights It is this very sorry. <laughs> it is this very same human experience that will change us and will enable us to make the world a better and safer place to live in. I don't promise you an easy journey, nor I'm assuming that it will be the same for everyone. But it's up to each of us to make our dreams come to life. It is up to each of us to keep pushing and pushing harder. And if we all do that from our various locations, whether from Africa, Europe, Asia, America, Latin America, wherever else one, one might be at a time, humanity will win. Once again, congratulations to all of us, and I wish you good luck in the future to come. Thank you so much. One would think we have coordinated our speeches. Um, now I have the pleasure and the honor to call uh, to our guest speaker who will deliver the keynote speech, Professor Laurence Boisson de Chazun, my dear faculty colleague, the director of the sister institution, which is the master in dispute settlement and indeed if they were fully successful we would no longer be needed if uh, disputes could be always settled according to law through legal procedures she um, is a former member of the human rights council advisory committee um, she is an associate member of the Institut de Droit International. I hope you understand what that means for an internationalist. Um, and uh, she uh, teaches the law of international organizations, international environmental law, general public international law. And she doesn't only teach that, but she also practiced this in uh, courts by advising governments, NGOs, international organizations. Laurence, please, you have the floor. Good evening. I would like first to thank Professor Sassoli, my dear colleague, for having invited me. And uh, it's true that I'm coming as a neighbor, a neighbor because I'm as uh, Professor Sassoli has said, I've become one of the co-directors of the Center of Dispute, International Dispute Settlement. And we're also neighbors because we have offices at the law faculty, which are really next one to each other. So it's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, I think it's a very important day for a lot of you. You're going to receive your diploma. And it's uh, important you've spent an important year in Geneva learning about the life of the law. And what you've learned, I think, is that law is not always straightforward. Its trajectory can be progressive, but it can also be regressive. And uh, this can change very quickly, as we can see today. So today, what I'd like to do with you is to look at the trajectories of international dispute settlement and of international humanitarian law and uh, human rights. And in particular, what I would like to do in the few minutes that I have 
is to see and to stress how these fields have evolved next to each other. And in fact, today I think we can speak of a very close relationship. When I'm going to be referring to human rights, I'm only going to be referring to human rights when they find application in the context of armed conflicts. So to properly tell the story about the relationship between uh, the relationships between international dispute settlement and humanitarian law, I think we have to go back to the Hague conferences of 1899 and of 1907. And uh, as you remember, it was not always that states were not able to resort to force to resolve their disputes. In the 19th century, they would resort to force to resolve their disputes. So what is important with the Hague conferences is that the states which came there negotiated conventions and they tried to establish a link between the regulation of force and the resort to peaceful dispute settlement mechanisms. So under the convention of 1899, it is said that arbitration should, is an important and effective way to resolve international disputes. And because of this preference for arbitration, the states also decided to establish an institution, the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which is located in The Hague. Now, the Hague Con Convention of 1907 stressed very clearly, and I quote, that uh, the intention of the convention was to obviate as, as far as possible recourse to force in the relations between states. And to do so, the signatory powers of the convention agreed, I quote, to use their best efforts to ensure the pacific settlement of international differences. So there was a concrete link which was established between what was called at that time peaceful dispute settlement mechanisms and mostly arbitration, and that of non-recourse to armed force. So in a way, dispute settlement was intended to be another facet of the regulation of the use of force. As you know, and you're a specialist in this field, the Hague conferences were also a time where attempts were made to regulate the conduct of warfare. And you have, we had also at that time the adoption of Hague Conventions, which followed the fo footsteps of the Geneva Convention of 1864. So to summarize what I want to say about the Hague Conferences and the Hague Conventions is that uh, resort to force was not, what was not prohibited at that time, but there were efforts which were made on one hand to regulate the conduct of hostilities, on the other hand to promote Pacific dispute settlement. And this link that was established, I think we have also have to go back to previous years, and in fact, we have to go back to Geneva. And it's in Geneva in 1872 that we have had the first real success story about arbitration, the Alabama, the Alabama arbitration, which took place in Geneva. The room of the Alabama is in the center of the city. It was perceived as a success story, this arbitration. And at that time, Gustave Monnier, whom you know all about, read about the story. And he thought that this story should be taken on board for promoting compliance with humanitarian law. And I owe this uh, idea to Francois Bignon, Dr. Francois Bignon, who is sitting there, who wrote a very interesting and, and, and I would recommend you to read it, a biography of Gustave Monnier, where Gustave Monnier was a, good, a great promoter of public international law and, and the resort to means for promoting respect for the rule of law. So now we move, we move with respect to the, this close relationship between dispute settlement and humanitarian law. And we move to the uh, League of Nations, the first international organization, universal international organization, which was established in Geneva. And there too, there is a step forward, which is this, an incremental step in a way that it was said in the covenant that the peaceful settlement of disputes should be tried first before the resort to force. So first, an attempt in good faith to try to settle a dispute in a pacific manner before resorting to force. At that time, resort to force was not yet prohibited. 
Then we had uh, the uh, pact, the Brian Kellogg Pact, which, which, banned, which uh, banned aggression as an instrument of national policy. And at the same time, we had another uh, pact, which is also important, the, the, uh, another treaty, the General Act for the Pacific Settlement of International Disputes of 1928. So this was the track of dispute settlement. Now, human nature and law was also moving. So in 1929, we had the adoption of two important Geneva Conventions, which were adopted. And these two conventions were following the footsteps that they were established in The Hague. And what is interesting for us from a perspective of dispute settlement is that they were providing for a few dispute settlement mechanisms, mostly diplomatic. But nothing was said about judicial dispute settlement in the context of humanitarian law. So we have these two trends. Now, what is interesting is that at the time of the League of Nations, states decided to establish the first permanent court of international justice. And this was an important achievement because it was a permanent court which had general competence. General competence means that the court could deal with issues of humanitarian law and human rights. Then we move. We move with the adoption of the UN Charter. The UN Charter is a very important time for all of us because at that time, the states decided to ban the resort to force, but also to promote resort to pacific dispute settlement mechanisms. And you have Article 33, which is giving an inventory of possible ways to settle disputes. In 1945, it was said that resort to force is prohibited in the conduct of international relations. Now, on its side, the uh, humanitarian law pass, the 1949 convention should be noted. And I think what is, uh, I think, important to have in mind is that surely that the, the negotiators of the 1949 conventions had in mind what had happened during the Second World War, and especially they had in mind what the a judicial institution, the Nuremberg Tribunal, had helped understand, you know, because there were all these accounts about the violations of international humanitarian law. So we see the contribution of a judicial mechanism for sort of pushing states to develop the rule of law in the conduct of hostilities. Now, if we move with the humanitarian law instruments, we think of the 1949 convention, nothing was really said about dispute settlement except good offices by the protecting powers and inquiry. But the convention is rather silent on these mechanisms. The uh, first additional protocol of 1977 is more vocal, I would say, about dispute settlements. So you have the establishment of a new mechanism the International Fact-Finding Commission. I'm not going to say anything about the success of these mechanisms, but at least there was an attempt to establish an inquiry commission. And then what I think is important too is that you have Article 89 of the Additional Protocol, which is also saying that in case of grave violations of international humanitarian law, there should be there should be a link to be established with the United Nations, so that means that the, mach the UN machinery, and especially chapter six and seven of the charter, should, should, should help resolve the issues of humanitarian law. So we have this past, but what is also interesting in the second part of the 20th century is that we have had what we call a multiplication of courts and tribunals. So we have had more and more disputes dealing with human rights, with international humanitarian law, but these disputes have moved uh, in the context and they've been brought before human rights courts and other uh, jurisdictions and especially the International Court of Justice. So what we see is that with the emergence of specialized jurisdictions such as the European Court of Human Rights, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, the African Court of Human Rights, we see this ever closer relationship between dispute settlement and humanitarian law. And I think we should also mention the treaty bodies because they are often forgotten, but they are also contributing to the implementation of in humanitarian law. 
And I'm thinking also of the uh, individual complaint mechanism for the uh, political and civil, uh, um, uh, com the, pol the uh, Committee on, on, on Political and Civil Rights, which is also important. And I'm thinking, for example, about the, the test of proportionality. This committee has developed the principle which is now referred to when one wants to define what, when one wants, wants to define what is proportionality. So contribution of these courts. Now, I come to the International Court of Justice. <clears throat> it's a court which is the judicial, it's a, one of the principal organs of the United Nations. It has a general competence and it's said in the statute of the court that it has to contribute to peace and security. And if you look at the case law of the International Court of Justice, I think that uh, this, uh, the, the court has significantly contributed to the development of international humanitarian law and human rights. It has first clarified the notion of jus cogens, the notion of uh, erga omnes obligations, uh, and the relationships between humanitarian law and human rights. And then we can think about seminal decisions that you've all studied, and for example, the advisory opinion on the legality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons, the wall opinion, which is very important, the case on armed activities on the territory of the Congo, and also the case which opposed Georgia to Russia in relation to the convention against uh, racial uh, discrimination. Now, if you look at the current role of the court, you will see that you have cases dealing with humanitarian law, and one of them, I think, is of importance. It's the Ukraine-Russia case, which is still pending before the International Court of Justice. So the court contributed. Not only the court, I spoke of the human rights, uh, human rights uh, institutions, I spoke about the International Court of Justice, we should also mention other newly established dispute settlement mechanisms, which are the criminal tribunals and court. And in the 90s, you have two tribunals, as you know, that were established, and the permanent court. And they also, each of them, have contributed uh, to strengthen the relationship between dispute settlement and humanitarian law. They have contributed to uh, ensure better, compli better compliance and better implementation of international humanitarian law. But as we all know, and Professor Cecil is one of the specialists of this field, compliance is still a very key issue in the field of the law of armed conflicts. And uh, I don't want to say that judicial institutions are the most efficient tools for resolving these issues of compliance and implementation. But I'm sure and I believe that they bring their contribution and they can work together with diplomatic means. And that is also something that I would like to stress is that we don't enough think about the links that we can establish between diplomatic means for resolving disputes and judicial means. And very often when states are brought before courts, they don't like it. So they might be in a better position to accept certain types of negotiations and so on. So we see, and I, what I've highlighted in this short speech is that there is a common purpose that was established at the end of the 19th century and that has been followed. And I think that today we've reached a point where you, we really have a close relationship. But this being said, I think that we should keep in mind that nothing is granted. We should not take everything, everything for granted. And in a, in, we live in a climate where, in fact, you have states which are exiting some of the courts or who are threatening the existence of some of the courts uh, or dispute settlement mechanisms. And uh, I would like to say that what we've seen in the, in, the, in the course of the 20th century should not be taken for granted because we have to resist to the attempt to not uh, to, to eliminate or to diminish the importance of independent judicial mechanisms for assessing the conduct of states at the international level. And I will conclude in saying that uh, I do feel that there are no better people than you, students of the academy, for resolving this issue and bringing to the forefront the, respect, the need for the respect of the rule of law and the need for judicial scrutiny about, of the conduct of uh, parties to a conflict. I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Laurence, for this very inspiring uh, speech. And now our heroes come uh, closer. 
And the first hero will obviously be the person who um, um, is gets the Henri Dunant Prize. Um, we thank very much the Henri Dunant Society and the and Henri Dunant Foundation that they offered the, a prize for a thesis which is most in line, a thesis in law, which is most in line with the ideas and ideals of Henri Dunant. And this prize will be presented by Dr. Francois Bunion, uh, who is a board member of the Henri Dunant Foundation, a former delegate, head of delegation, director of law and policy of the International Committee of the Red Cross, a member of the assembly of the International uh, Committee of the Red Cross, and also a scholar who has written important books on the cross line of law, politics, and history. Francois, please, you have the floor. Merci beaucoup, Marco. Uh, Monsieur le Directeur, cher Marco, distinguished professors and scholars, dear students, or maybe I should correct myself, dear graduate students or former students. Everybody in this auditorium knew who was Henry Dunant, so I don't need to tell you, and I will not tell you that he was the founder of the Red Cross and the promoter of the first Geneva Convention of 22 August 1864, which is really the starting point of contemporary international humanitarian law. On the other hand, everybody in this room can be forgiven for ignoring that there has been in Geneva for the last 40 years or more the Henry Dunant Society, a society of historians and members of the family of Henry Dunant, not direct uh, heirs because Henry Dunant had no children, but uh, collateral members of the family. The society has been conducting research to know better the life and work of Henry Dunant and to uh, make his life and work better known. And his ideas by publications, organizing colloquiums, and at the initiative of an eminent member of the society, Mrs. Pierrette Bourgedalgue, the society created a foundation for awarding a Henry Dunant Prize. And Mrs. Pierrette Bourgedalgue deserve also gratitude for having made a substantial donation which permits to give not just a certificate for the laureates, but also a small envelope which may be useful for a publication or anything else. So creating a Henry Dunant Prize for research with the objective reward an exceptional academic work which contributes to deepen, spread, and renew the ideals of Henry Dunant through law. So the combination of idealism, not the ideas, but the ideals of Henry Dunant with law. This prize has been awarded every year since 2005, and this always in partnership with your academy. In practice, a first selection is made of the best LLM papers, and uh, also, of course, making sure that there are papers which respond to the objectives and criteria of the prize. And then you have a small jury with a representation of the Academy, representation of the International Committee of the Red Cross, Mr. Etienne Kuster, and members of the Foundation, the Council of the Foundation. I must say that uh, having taken being part of the jury. Uh, so now I have become a legitimate objective, I'm afraid. Uh, having been part of the jury, I want to express gratitude to the professors of the academy because they always forwarded to us outstanding papers, which I must confess made the work of the jury every year difficult. 
to select among papers, all of them are of a very high quality. Nevertheless, at the end, the jury has to do its work, which means to select one laureate. And this year, I am pleased to announce the laureate is Mrs. Anna Rosalie Greipel. Who, who submitted a remarkable document, a remarkable paper on the team, International State Responsibility, the role of Italy in outsourcing migration management to Libya. The jury uh, paid attention to the academic quality of this paper, the strong legal analysis with the interplay of different branches of the law, the law, not of course, on state responsibility, but humanitarian law, international human rights law, and refugee law together with domestic law. The relevance of the topic today and the relevance also of this memoir in terms of the heritage of Henry, Henry Dunant. It could be said it was a very narrow subject because the paper is basically an in-depth, I hope I do not commit any injustice, an in-depth analysis of the Memorandum of Understanding of 2nd February 2017, outsourcing migration issues to Libya. And the paper demonstrates how, through this document, Italy evaded its obligations by passing, forgive me the, the word, passing the hot potato to the Libyan authorities, provided they are Libyan authorities. And of course, through this, denying, as the paper clearly demonstrates, denying migrants the possibilities of using the normal procedures provided for in domestic law and in international mechanism. Uh, first of all, human rights, mechanism for the protection of human rights. So on the face of it, it could appear as, as one of my colleagues would say, a thesis on a postal stamp. In fact, it touches a very general problem because Italy is not alone, unfortunately, in this kind of policy. So, in fact, it touches all the European states' policies to send the hot potato back to the people, the countries on the other side of the Mediterranean. It concerns, of course, one of the most burning issues of all time. Now, the relationship with Henry Dunant, you could say or ask, Henry Dunant was not just the founder of the Red Cross and promoter of the First Geneva Convention. He was also concerned with many different issues. As a young man already, he was a very active member of the anti-slavery movement. As an older man in pacifism, in women's right, which, by the way, connected with pacifism and many other topics, and more generally concerned for the most vulnerable. Today, Obviously, the migrants are among the most vulnerable. We know the fate of Syrian refugees. We know what happened across the Mediterranean. We know the fate of the Rohingyas. We know today of this caravan of people moving from Honduras to the United States, which I'm afraid will probably lead to a big tragedy tomorrow. And also, the memoir connects with the issue of sla slavery, which was very dear to Henry Dunant's mind. I congratulate the laureate and thank you all for your attention.
I will try my best with my voice today, but thank you very much for the kind introduction and good evening to everyone present here tonight. First of all, I would like to thank the foundation to award me this prize. It's a great honor to know that the jury has deemed that my research reflects and advances Henri Dunant's ambitious humanitarian ideals and visions. Yet, I would not be here today without some significant support from friends and family, but also intellectual support. The most significant intellectual support has come from experts and professors at the Geneva Academy. In particular, Niels Melzer, my supervisor of the thesis. I would also like to express my gratitude to my academic peers who have been a meaningful intellectual support through exchange of ideas and thoughts, as well as their vital moral support through the most intensive periods of this year. Thank you. So let me just say a few words to my work and how I, did to, how I came to the topic. I will try to stay brief and not too technical. One of the most numerous human crises across the world is the so often called migration or refugee crisis. And it has received tremendous attention in the media in recent years and is on a high level on the political agendas, especially from most of the European Western countries. The discussion on migration has been highly polarized, instrumentalized, and has led to disturbing and absurd situations. One of, no, and so, um, the growing interest of European state in reducing arrivals of refugees and migrants has led them to shift their approach progressively from rescue operations where they save migrants at sea towards border control measures that um, border control measures um, outside of Europe to third countries. A first shift took place when EU member states started intensifying <coughs> and their actions making use of violent pushback measures. But when the European Court of Human Rights found Italy in 2012 responsible for, hum for its human rights violation, the um, EU member states adopted new measures, measures that would prevent the entry of migrants and refugees in the first place. In view of this, sh the, the shift of this approach was absolutely important to me to understand. Um, because outsourcing migration control measures to third state, EU member states from there expect to circumvent human rights bodies and dilute their international responsibility. Examples of such measures are the adoption of agreements with or funding programs for third countries as to ensure that their authorities would be the primary actors of intercepting and bringing migrants back to third countries. Of course, all these measures are most frequently portrayed as humanitarian responses to the so-called migration refugee crisis and serving an absolutely noble goal, naming saving lives, preventing migrants from taking dangerous journey or to dismantling traffickers and smugglers network. One of the first chapter of this new area of cooperation is the bilateral agreement between Italy and the Libyan backed, UN backed government. This bilateral collaboration agreement raises particular concerns. Numerous publicly available documents, articles and journals continually reported the current human rights violations um, that refugees and migrants are subjected to in Libya. Consequently, this would mean that any measures taken to send back or keep refugees and migrants in Libya would inevitably infringe their human rights, right? Or could EU member states, and in this case Italy, by simply outsourcing border control measures to Libya 
and therefore eliminating any territorial or physical contact between refugees or migrants and their own authorities divest itself from its responsibility for these violations? How can EU member states honestly defend human rights values across the world and at the same time adopt behaviors that ignore human rights for purely economic or political interests? In light of these worrying questions, I decided to inquire alternative measures under international law um, that would enable us to find Italy or may held responsible for outsourcing migration control measures to third countries, and in my case, I choose Italy and Libya. The lack of any territorial physical contact between refugees and migrants and the, and the Italian authorities led me to Article 16 of the draft Articles on State Responsibility. This article regulates derived responsibility for aiding and assisting third, um, other states in the commission of an internationally wrongful act. In other words, the responsibility of Italy arises from the fact that Italy is fa facilitating the human rights violation in Libya and not for the commission itself. The complexity of Article 16 on state responsibilities lies particularly in the mental element. The reason is that the required standard as a measure of positive law is not settled yet. But the investigation on the current debate applied in the Italian Libyan case led me to the conclusion that a lower intent should prevail for following reasons. Accepting a higher threshold of the mental element would mean that although fully aware of the commission of the abuses, states such as Italy may evade the responsibility simply because they did not intend such result. Let's think about that. How many states clearly express their intent to commit a human rights violation? Most of the time, these are rather results from the fact that states further their national or economic interests irrespective of violations that they may facilitate. Another reason is that I believe the need of, for that I defend the need for a lower threshold is um, especially true in situations where we have acts of torture and inhuman or degrading treatments that have been manifestly committed, such in the case in Libya. <clears throat> Accordingly, where Libya is supported by Italy and it is so obvious that Libya is systematically violating a central component of the prohibition of torture, Italy should not allow to hide behind the position that it did not wish to support and had not the intent to commit the crimes of torture. In my opinion, accepting the contrary would amount to allowing Italy to let Libya do the unpleasant work or hold the potato in the attempt to deny any responsibility. All in all, the analysis of Article 16 of the draft Articles on State Responsibility as an alternative measure in international law to hold states responsible for their aid and assistance brought me to the conclusion that despite the debate surrounded the mens rea element, Italy will still, still incur international state responsibility for their aid and assistance to Libya. Allow me to insist in my concluding remarks Sorry. that in light of the current trend towards increasing practices of outsourcing migration management to third countries, it is absolutely central to look for alternatives in international law in order to find state responsible for their aid and assistance they offer to third states. Not only in order to prevent them from evading from their responsibilities for those violations, but also in order to ensure effective remedies to individuals who are the victims of those violations. In a similar way, as the European Court's decision did, any other court and tribunal, as well as legal practitioners and policymakers, may lead to shift states' behavior in this regard. Finally, we must not forget that Henri Dunant's unconditional determination to denounce the established order when it shocks has already shown that, as it, idealistic it may appear, one man's vision 
can become reality. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much. Thank you also to the Henri Dunant uh, Prize Foundation to have accepted what, in my view, is the first time the, there was a preconceived idea that you can get the Henri Dunant Prize only if you write about international humanitarian law. You are the proof that this is not true and it is fully li in line with uh, Henri Dunant. Now, I have a more difficult task than uh, François Bignon uh, because I should announce the recipient of the best LLM paper from a purely academic point of view, but um, I will try to explain why it also has uh, implications for human beings and uh, the recipient does not know yet that she will get uh, the prize. Um, so the recipient is Mrs. Antoana Nedialteva. <laughs> um, she has she has written an excellent LLM paper about judicial notice, uh, and uh, sorry with the parents and friends, it sounds very theoretical, but it has an important implication, I will explain. Um, judicial notice of adjudicated facts at the ad hoc international criminal tribunals and the right to a fair trial. This is a clear, sharp, nuanced, and technically perfect uh, paper written under the supervision of my predecessor, Professor Robert Roth. Uh, the issue behind it, I try to explain, is that in case of mass atrocities, tribunals get lost if they have in every case to prove and to take the evidence on all the elements of the crimes if they cannot refer to previous judgments where they dealt with the same issue, for instance, whether there was a genocide in Rwanda. But the problem is that uh, those facts previously established in other cases, the accused had no chance to uh, have his or her own evidence against it to discuss that because it was a case against another accused and here's the depressing reality which most lawyers know is that tribunals can never establish the material truths but only a procedural truth and therefore it may well be that the previous accused didn't have the best lawyers and therefore was not able to destroy the theory of the prosecutor. And therefore there is a tension between this necessity, otherwise mass atrocities can no longer be judged, and the essential element of a fair trial. And Mrs. Nedjolkova dealt with this in a very nuanced and, in our view, excellent way Congratulations. So, we should stand here because the photographer otherwise. <laughs> Okay, so now we have the best master in transitional justice paper, and it will be my colleague Brian Palman who will announce. It. 
So we also, it was said before that the quality of the papers in the LLM was very good. We had the same very fortunate situation, so we, it was a tough choice to be made, a nice tough choice to be made, because it's really good to see that at the end of the year you have this quality. At the end, the jury decided unanimously for one paper, and the author of this paper is Sushmita, uh, Sushmita Hayandan. Congratulations. Let me read, I have the pleasure to read out to you the motivation of the jury. Um, you, Shushmita wrote a brilliant paper on the topic of constitution making as a guarantee of non-recurrence, the case of Sri Lanka. The jury has been impressed by, the, impressed by the great accuracy, academic thoroughness, and argumentative coherence of this paper, which addresses an important topic that remains largely underexplored. Displaying a remarkable grasp of the relevant literature and discussions in the field, the paper engages thoughtfully with the question of how and to which extent constitutional reform for initiatives can potentially contribute to non-recurrence in post-conflict Sri Lanka. Far from a merely ab abstract discussion of the issue at hand, the paper proposes specific aspects to be concretely addressed by a constitutional reform process, including reform of the Bill uh, of Rights and new power-sharing arrangements. Moreover, the paper, paper aptly integrates current theoretical debates into the concrete context of post-conflict Sri Lanka and addresses head-on practical challenges that may potentially arise in this respect. In doing so, the paper makes a solid, well-balanced case for integrating constitution-making into the transitional justice repertoire, particularly in post-conflict contexts such as Sri Lanka, with a, an important history of constitution-making. By creatively linking theory and practice the paper makes a valuable addition to ongoing debates in the field. With all this in mind, the jury is delighted to award Mrs. Lucia Sushmita Tayandan with the best TGM paper prize. So now the most important announcements will be done, the graduations of our uh, students. And uh, here the master <laughs> of ceremony is obviously uh, Danny Diogo. So we'll first start with the LLM, then we'll continue with the NTJ and end up with the executive master. Um, I will call you one by one and invite you to come on stage to retrieve your diploma to the director. Uh, then you can take a few seconds to pose and take a picture, individual picture with a photographer <laughs> and gather in the corners and then when all the classmates have been called, we can come all together on stage for the group picture and we do um, a final group picture for each program, okay? So the first 2017-2018 uh, LLM graduate is Yasmin Afina Cum Laude. Congratulations. <laughs> Teresa Amigo, magna cum laude, congratulations. Masru Ansari, summa cum laude, congratulations.
Francisco as to the OPG, congratulations. First person again, uh, cum laude. Oh, sorry. Congratulations. <laughs> Leana Burnard, magna cum laude. Congratulations. <laughs> Astrid Sederlov, Magna Cum Laude. <laughs> Eugenia Dorokova, Cum Laude. Katarina Emner, cum laude. <laughs> Paola Fudakowska, cum laude. Anna Greipel, Magna Cum Laude. <laughs> Cassie Guthrie Jones, Cum Laude. Wang Yuan Ao, cum laude. <laughs> Antoana Marinova Nedialkova, magna cum laude. Joanna McIntyre, cum laude. <laughs> Krista Nutakor, cum laude. Darren Uyong, Magna Cum Laude. <laughs> 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 
Elisabeth Pramendorfer, magna cum laude. Guilhem Puriplana, magna cum laude. Martina Salini, cum laude. Margherita Stevoli, magna cum laude. Lina Stotz, magna cum laude. Oriane Vendrou, cum laude. <applaudissements> Catherine Walton, magna cum laude. And the last one for the LLM, Meron Yared. She's not here yet. Yeah, she is. <laughs> and now it's time to take a, gr a group picture so you can come all to the stage. And now it's the turn of the MTJ program. So the first 2017-2018 MTJ student is Marie-Charlotte Baudry, magna cum laude. Chiara Kizari, magna cum laude. <laughs> Ma 
Yorim Choi Kumlarde. Marie Diaz Marquez, Suma Kumlarde. Idelki Familia de Sorat, Magna Kumlarde. Jamila Mami Cum Laude. <applaudissements> Gargi Katiki Tala. Congratulations. <laughs> Nele Lowers, Magna Cum Laude. <applaudissements> Clémence Le Duc, Magna Cum Laude. Arpita Mitra, Magna Cum Laude. <applaudissements> Carolina Oliveira Begeli, Cum Laude. Owizo, Owizo, Suma Cum Laude. <applaudissements> Kete Van Fritz Cum Laude. Audrey Purcell, Magna Cum Laude. <rires> Shiva Sharif Saad, Magna Cum Laude. Anne-Sophie Stockman, Magna Cum Laude. <applaudissements> Sushmita Tayanandan, Summa Cum Laude.
and Nal Zebarjadi summa cum laude. Same here, now you can all come to the stage, please. <laughs> And now the executive master. So the first 2016-2018 graduate is Anthony Alonbu. Congratulations. Wow. Sophie Capicciano Young, congratulations. <laughs> Yolanda Joltopouf, congratulations. Ryan Lender, congratulations. <laughs> Arthur Lestayev, congratulations. Juan Carlos Moreno, congratulations. <laughs> Giudone Muniyang Alunda, congratulations. Ariane Napop, congratulations. <laughs> Mirwais Kaderi, congratulations. Joao Polo Rodriguez Calvacente, congratulations. <laughs> Fazel Waziri, congratulations.
Avalia, Kyoti, et Lenny. Congratulations. <laughs> Martina Serrasoli, congratulations. And the last participant graduating tonight, Sandra Velasco Perez. Congratulations. <laughs> Group picture. Okay. And now we could obviously make a speech about the relationship between justice and human rights, but we will not. Uh, just to thank the team uh, which has organized uh, this evening perfectly. I mentioned them before, and now you are all welcome to the famous canopy of the Graduate Institute. Sorry, my dean, they are better than at the university, but we have many things which are better at the university. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>